Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, regular meeting of the School Committee of the Town of Foxborough. It's January 4th, 2016. Happy New Year to everybody. We have, thank you. We have kind of a kind of a short meeting, anticipated short. You never know, right? That's the curse of death. But um, <laughs> visitors followed by approval of minutes. And then primarily a, a financial discussion tonight. We're going to do the FY17 budget continued discussion. We have Dr. Sandra Einzel here tonight to help us with some of the special ed discussion that came up in the last meeting. Uh, Mr. Yukna will then give us our first discussion of the 2016-2017 capital improvement plan. Uh, he'll give us a FY16 budget update. Ms. Spinelli has a, a BICO, Bi-County Collaborative Quarterly Report. We have an acceptance of a donation, and then we'll take up other matters. Uh, I usually ask at this time for other visitors, but I think they are all in watching the uh, basketball game. But I do see one hand up. Yes, sir? Um, I wanted to bring up one suggestion that the teachers kept telling me about. You need to You need to state your name. My name is Joe. I'm from Foxborough High School. Okay. Thank and, you. And um, some of the teachers were telling me just a month ago about that instead of doing our two full professional development days in the school year, what we usually do, we should do it like uh, like half days because it still counts as a full school day. Then it saves time instead of making up all the days in June. Mm. That's a good suggestion, I just wonder if we, you guys can just bring that up to the teachers' union. We'll uh, we'll leave that up to uh, Ms. Spinelli to do that, yeah. okay? And we're gonna we, we're gonna look at the calendar again in a couple of weeks. We have actually thought of that um, a few times over the last several years, but we're not a great fan of those half day early releases. So it's unlikely. Well, other towns do it. Yes, but I've worked in another town that does it. I'm not that, and as has Dr. Burdos, and we didn't have very good experiences with that. So we'll see, but it's. All ideas are good ideas, Joe, but I'm not so sure we're going to yeah. go for that yeah, one. Yeah, because I was asking Mr. Kayser one day, and he said before or after America at War it was, and then I asked, can, can you bring up to the teachers' union about half days? Because I've done that before, but it didn't work. Right. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, okay. Thank you, Joe. Seeing no other visitors, I'd like to start with the uh, regular meeting minutes, which might be behind the other minutes in your packet. These are the regular meeting minutes of December 21st. I know I didn't see any uh, comments that I wanted to make beyond how they're presented. Did anybody else see anything? No. Nope. No changes. I'll move to accept, approve the uh, min minutes of December 21st, 2015. I'll second that. Presented. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 4 0. We are without uh, Mrs. Lord tonight. It's very lonely over on this side yes, of the well. table, I gotta say. <laughs> Uh, and now we'll take up the executive session meeting minutes from December 7th. I had no comments. No comments here. Yeah. Want to make a motion, Steve? Sure. Motion to accept as presented the executive uh, session meeting minutes of December 7th, 2015. Great. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Four zero. I want to take just a minute while we are um, on these minutes. Um, the public, of course, doesn't have the uh, the minutes, and we'll we'll motion to uh, release them in just a minute. Um, but I just want to share with the public, since they can't see these at home, what the content was of these. We spent some time last month taking a look at the superintendent's salary again, and just for public reminder, uh, we did that back in August, and at the time. Uh, of course, we had uh, come off an exemplary rating of Mrs. Spinelli once again for her what we thought was a great year, and we had uh, approved a 2.5% raise. One of the things that, uh, or the, uh, the main thing, that these minutes uh, reflect, and if anyone, of course, wants a copy, they can see them, they'll, they'll be on public file, but we did in December uh, agree to uh, ex expand her raise from a 2.5% raise approval from August to a 3.5% raise so we approved an additional one percent increase um sorry i thought it was three total it was from two to three i think it's only another half a percent from two to three a two and a half to three i believe although i didn't have it with me but i believe well i it's will uh, i do have it with me did you it was a right two and a half raise additional increase of one percent 
My, my notes are consistent with what the minutes oh, okay. here reflect, mm -hmm. which was a three and a half percent raise. Did anybody else have thought on that? That's my recollection. That's I what we that, no that, well, I, I don't have my notes with me, but I know I wrote them, wrote the minutes from my notes. Then we have so. to take a look at the addendum that mm -hmm. we signed, because that's what I'm thinking of, which is what I saw. I don't see the, these good seven minutes when I'm not there. So we need to just take a look at the addendum that was crafted. All right. But and either I, way, I, thank you. To your, to your <laughs> point for the public, could you restate what we have in the minutes and yep. what we plan on going forward? But yeah, what, what, we, what we had approved back in August was a 2.5% raise for the superintendent, which at the time we thought was um, conservative, but uh, we wanted to ensure that she had a raise. But the more we thought about it as a committee, and in light of her exemplary rating, and in light of some work we've done to uh, to add some flexibility into the non-union personnel uh, raise approach or process, we decided it was right to uh, to offer the superintendent an additional one percent increase. So that's what the minutes reflect: is an additional one percent increase to the superintendent's two and a half percent raise approved in August, and that's consistent with uh, what I recollect uh, okay. the case being. And if there is any confusion, Deb, Bill, Janet, we'll, uh, we'll make sure the addendum is right. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm not sure there is confusion, but I remember when we went to payroll about it that Bill and I both nodding the same thing. When we went to payroll about the adjustment right after that, which is before the holidays, the adjustment was only another half percent. So, so I, we just need, need to check either how it was worded or, or something. So we'll take care of that, but I thank, you, I thank the committee <laughs> very much there for There was doing also that. a $1,000 increase exactly. to the uh, travel and phone uh, mm -hmm. Um, compensation right. benefit as well. Right. And I just after all the confusion I just created by frowning, I'm like, was that really? What? Um, I, I appreciate it, especially because it's taken us some work, and I, I do appreciate the committee working with me about the um, the very real, um, I'll call it a dilemma, of how do you reflect cost of living increases and merit when uh, for people who are non-unionized who don't have steps. And, um, and, and lanes to move across or down that once you get into a salary position in education, which, which is the minority of our staff members, it's only a few people, mostly administrators, then you know, it's, it's hard to do that. And we've certainly had a lot of discussion about that in terms of how other public entities do it, including the town side. So I, I appreciate that because that's not an easy thing to tackle. So thank you very much. Yeah, we didn't have this as an agenda item anywhere, but I just wanted to be transparent with the public and make sure they were aware that we had taken that action last month. We certainly think it's uh, um, in line with the way that uh, Debbie has served our district, and uh, we also, as part of that process, went through, and the committee knows this, but again, for public basis, went through uh, a survey of other area superintendents. We certainly looked at uh, what some of our municipal leaders in town were receiving as raises, what was affordable from the standpoint of the finance director in town. So we're very pleased to increase the superintendent's raise by an additional 1%. So that's what these minutes reflect. Again, I know that Tina and I had talked. I'm sure um, Steve and Marilyn and Bevy would feel the same, that it was important that we you know, just be open and, uh, in what we've done. So uh, thank you to the committee for approving the minutes. And now would we uh, like to take a motion to release these minutes? Uh, I will make the motion to release. I, I just wanted to add, too, that it was a unanimous vote of the committee. All right. This was a unanimous choice decision, Great. rather. Thanks, Tina. So we have a motion to release? Motion to release uh, the executive I committee <coughs> minutes of December 7th. I'll second that motion. <laughs> we'll reverse it. It's all okay. good. OK. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? 4 0. Thank you. <coughs> okay, FY17 budget continued discussion. Just as a preliminary before Sandra comes up. Um, right, so we want to give Dr. Ryan a little time to come right up to the guest table. We did modify the one sheet, uh, which you have a copy of uh, on right. the major components, uh, to include the full day universal kindergarten uh, notation and how that that was actually being uh, derived at in year one. Um, we talked about the 95,000, but uh, 55,000 is the elimination of the kindergarten grant, which, um, you know, is fully expected by next year. So whether or not the town really wished to move forward full day kindergarten, that 55,000 is not going to be part of our budget for next year anyway. Uh, it's a cost that we're going to have to bear uh, to move forward. The other 40000 is we're going to reduce the use of our tuition revolver uh, for next year to enable us to basically be able to get through the four-year phased program 
um, on the 95,000 a year. So we did change that. It was a request to the school committee to make sure it was a little clearer on how that uh, was accounted for. Um, and so if you could just replace that in your package. So just while we're <clears throat> on that point, Bill, and I, I may have a follow-up question, but just to reset the stage for anyone tuning in tonight who wasn't here on the December 21st mm -hmm. meeting, the, uh, the preliminary discussion of our proposed FY17 budget calls for a request of 3.9%. Uh, a lot of the increase we discussed at that meeting is around special ed uh, and the increase of uh, placements out of district placements from 22 to 29 but on the point you're talking about this was a request I had I think initiated yes. where we're also looking at the implementation of full day universal kindergarten which is really the only other uh, significant incremental it change is. or add to our expense line uh, from a programmatic standpoint. So our budget, right. again, for those just tuning in, our budget approach for this year is uh, level services um, with the addition of the Universal Kindergarten Program and now this special education incremental cost that we're going to spend most of this That's portion correct. of the meeting. So, so back to your point, Bill, and I appreciate you clarifying it a little bit. So um, is the net, I, I still want to just be very clear in my own thinking and then that of the public, by implementing the full day kindergarten, which increases to the, or, or adds to this 3.97% increase proposal. It's included in that. It's, in, it's included in that. Yes. The, the incremental cost that that contributes, is, that, is it right to think that that's a $90,000 incremental? It's a 95000 uh, per year for four years. Okay. So of our 3.9% increase, increase 95,000 of that is this universal connection, which I think is, I know we all support, we've, we've talked in this, at this table about how we all support the program. I just want to be very clear in how much of the increase that, that is being driven by that particular programmatic Right, $95,000. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. of, the, of the entire budget. That's correct. Right. And it's the first year we want to make sure if people weren't watching in December, it's the first year of a four year phase out plan, which, as you remember, was the committee request last year when we couldn't do it all in one. The committee requested a phase out, a financial plan that would help phase it out so it wouldn't hurt quite as much. And that's what we're hopefully going to implement next year is year one of that plan. Anybody else want to comment? Are we all good? Just that we're this sourcing from the revolving fund as well. That yes. Those the, yeah, we're, we're the costs are not just out of thin air. They're being moved from what will be a revolving fund that's going to go down over the phase right. Right. or Locks. soft landing, yes. as we might right. characterize it. Yes. Yeah. By Good the point. end of the by the end of the four years, the revolving account will be basically to zero, mm -hmm. and we won't be replenishing it obviously because we won't be charging any further. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we actually, uh, um, are there any more questions about kindergarten? Because it's reminding me to say something else. Um, we actually have one more programmatic addition that is not costing uh, any money that I can't believe I forgot to say in December because uh, Mr. Uden and I had a very in exciting conversation about it before the meeting and I forgot and now here we are again. So um, we've talked about the implementation of a computer science course at the high school and we do still plan to go forward with that for September. However, it's one course one class period and we feel that we can fold that into our existing structure at the high school. So you'll see as you did in December there are no um, staff changes at the high school at all. There are no re uh, additions but we expect to be able to accommodate that within the staffing budget that we have at the high school. So that is a programmatic enhancement mm -hmm. but it is not included in the budget and we haven't called it out in the budget because it's just instead of teaching one course no somebody's going to teach it. another course. So mm -hmm. did want to call that out though because it is something that we've been looking forward to I know yeah. as a community for quite a while. So I want to thank the committee uh, and the audience for letting me go through that because I think whenever we ask for an increase um, you know it, I think I think it's important to recognize that we're trying to be as responsible as we can and this 3.97 percent initial preliminary view really is not about adding a lot of programs mm -hmm. it's about sustaining programs with a couple of additions right. full day kindergarten potentially right. coding program right and the full day kindergarten isn't really a programmatic um, addition it's as a community do we believe that educational programs should especially those that are academic should be tuition free right so I think it's more of a philosophical um, budget change yep. in in terms of what our community believes in and stands for and we don't have any other fees so 
I think we had reached the point since 2000, September 2008, we've had full-day kindergarten where we're saying it doesn't make sense to still have a fee for an academic program when we don't have fees for other types of things in, right. in this community. So I think it's a, a kind of community value yeah, more than I would well call said. it a programmatic enhancement. I, also, I actually would like to share something, too, that I received the day after we had that meeting, um, and it was from Jack Othelet. Basically, he sent a, an email to me saying it was his, with his deepest appreciations that the school committee made this move uh, to open the door to the full-day kindergarten program to allow students of all to, in our uh, public school program. Um, he has longed for this for years, that children who need it the most, families who which struggled the hardest to pay for it are now going to be included in, in this program as it unfolds. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was kind of a nice note to get from somebody on, on the outside, but it, it, it does show that it's, it's you know, other people in the community that have been looking for this as well and, and feeling that we should be doing this, in, making this move. I actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually received one as well mm -hmm. uh, from a, a, a new, newer community member who has moved within the last two years here, not anyone known to us necessarily, and who has still preschool age children. Um, who was recommended to move here by an administrator I used to work with in another community who also became a school committee member upon retirement in that community. And he had sent me an, a note when he first moved here about two years ago saying this mutual acquaintance and friend had su suggested that he really consider Foxborough great schools there and you can't go wrong. And, and when he read this in the paper said, could this really be true? Boy, you know, that was the one thing I contacted you about when I moved here and I read in the paper there was still a fee. Now I see why this community really takes its education seriously and continues to make moves and this made me really happy and reinforced our decision to move here upon his recommendation. So I think it really is a, a community value that um, I'm personally very pleased that we've been able to begin our quest to eliminate the tuition. So thank you. So I think that lays the groundwork. For, oh, I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. Could I just also add yeah. a great thanks to our administration for getting the computer science uh, curriculum uh, rolling. It, it is one of our superintendent's goals. Um, it's, it's now met. Um, but, you know, like our music and athletic department, we're going to get to see more creativity and mm -hmm. compassionate imagination and I don't know, there's going to be a, a nice mm -hmm. path forward for a lot of students with this program, and uh, I'm thrilled. Deb and I talked, and, and uh, personally and frankly politically is one of the things I ran on is, is, is this is a, a really uh, wonderful thing, I think, for our school system, and cost-effectively implemented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So hallelujah, it's here. Good. <laughs> Very excited. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, I think what I was trying to do was set the baseline for now the discussion with Dr. Einzel about, okay, well, you're asking for a 3.9 percent increase. Where is it going? And uh, there are some other line items. I don't mean to sound like there's nothing else. There's some small, much smaller pieces that Bill presented at the last meeting, if anyone wants to see them. But we did talk about this special ed change or mm -hmm. increase. So mm -hmm. I don't know, Deb or Bill, if you want to. Sure. I don't mind starting. Um, we asked Dr. Einzel to be here. In, uh, as we discussed in December, in our hope is to um, have Dr. Einzel and Bill and me and Amy and whoever else can add to it to give you and the, and the community and the public kind of a general sense of what's driven this increased costs um, without giving so much specific information because as you know, students with um, individual educational programs um, or IEPs, we, we can only talk about so much. And so we'll talk in some cases in generalities, but we want to be able to explain with transparency what has driven, you know, this increase this year because it's not something we've experienced. It's uh, what other communities have experienced mm -hmm. often, and I think we haven't been used to experiencing that, and so we're facing it for the first time. So Dr. Einzel has a few thoughts for you, and then feel free to ask questions. Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me to address some of these needs. Um, the reason we are having an increase in um, special ed costs both this year and next year um, are regarding students with a social, emotional, and really significant behavioral challenges. They're not your students with specific learning disabilities or the, the sole academic reasons. They are really uh, for students with social, emotional, and behavioral challenges. And um, I think in generally, Generally speaking, the cause that we need, um, that these students need additional um, adult support or even a different educational setting would be the students have a tendencies to um, have unsafe behavior towards themselves or others, um, or they cannot regulate themselves to learn in the public school environment. 
So those, those are, those are the, that's the majority of reason for the increase this year and for next year. And, and please feel free to ask me questions as we <coughs> go forward. So, um, so what are we doing about this? I think that when you hired me two years ago, one of the things that you brought up when I was interviewing was we, we've got these students' um, needs, the special needs for um, their social emotional needs. And um, I'll let you know what we've been doing. Um, we have been working with Walker Partnerships, which is an outreach program for, um, from Walker, Pub uh, Walker School in Needham, Massachusetts, and it's a private special ed school focusing on students with social emotional needs and behavioral challenges. And um, we have a Walker partner, his name is Joe Restucia, who has been working with our TEAM programs. Those are our programs for students with social emotional concerns, and TEAM stands for a therapeutic environment with an academic mission. And he's been helping me and the team people really get continuity of programming from elementary to middle to middle to high school. So the processes and procedures are, are this very similar. How we work with different students um, and their issues are very similar. He also is a clinical um, um, assistance too with specific students that um, have been very challenging for us. While working with him, he has um, shared with us a, a, a connection with uh, Mass General Hospital, and it's called Think Kids. And it's a program run by um, Dr. Stu Avalon. And he, um, Think Kids is really about rethinking how we work with students with social emotional issues. And it's really about developing a kind of a social emotional IQ skills for all students. And it's um, based on collaborative problem solving and um, primarily developing skills in the areas of flexibility, um, problem solving, and frustration tolerance. So we invited him to come out, and he and his, his um, assistant, um, Dr. Alicia Polastri, um, Dr. Ablon worked with all of the um, faculty, a half, half day with elementary and a half day with middle school and high school, really talking about the basics of what is um, Think Kids or Collaborative Problem Solving. And then his colleagues spent an entire day with the ed assistants and myself and a cohort of um, faculty such as guidance counselors, adjustment counselors, MSWs, um, school psychologists. We had the team teachers there. Really so we could become experts in Think Kids at this point in time. And the cohort will then work, uh, is working with uh, Mass General for the rest of the year. Again, continuing to develop expertise within. In addition to that, Joe Restucia, he's our Walker partner, um, is going to be coming um, this winter to um, present a graduate course on trauma and learning so that uh, staff who are interested in this will really understand that who is in front of us, their experiences in life, we really have to understand better so that we can actually respond to their learning style. So those are um, some training opportunities that we've had recently. And um, we'll continue, hope, hopefully, with Think Kids um, for an, um, at least the next year or two. In addition to this, we have um, people who come in and uh, that are consultants. We work closely with a psychiatrist from MGH, a neuropsychologist, um, who helps um, specifically with students with have more of a neurological um, aspect to their learning. Um, we work with a professor from Fitchburg State, um, working with our PAVE program which is a, a program for a partnership, academic, and vocational excellence. That's primarily, that's actually on all three levels as well. We have a transition specialist who is working with us, uh, particularly at the high school level, because a lot of our students are uh, actually leaving or preparing to leave public education and going into adult services. They'll either go to the Department of um, developmental services, they might go to um, might go to work, or they might go on to post-secondary. So we have all these people working with us to develop programs here and, and have our students really have the opportunity to be educated here in the community. And um, so they've been supporting both students and staff. And as you already know, we've asked for a 0.5 increase for a school psychologist at the Ahern. Um, because of the, some of the social emotional concerns we've had, as well as a 0.2 um, increase at the elementary level for an adjustment counselor. Um, some takeaway points. I just want you to remember, as, as um, we've talked tonight, um, that we really are responding to the new challenges of social, um, the problems with social emotional issues with our young people, as well as um, the challenging behaviors. And I want you to know we're building capacity within. Um, we're getting, being trained, and we're really um, focusing on this, these areas. 
And I also want you to know that we're working to step down our students that have been in substantially separate programs and have them come back to our, our, our community, to our mm -hmm. building, to our programs, because we really feel that if it's appropriate, they really belong here in Foxborough. And lastly, I want you to I just want to remind you that when we budgeted last year, we budgeted at 22 people out. By June, there was 24 people out. And through the fall, we really have been working with a, a number of students. And um, we probably have at least five or six students that are in the process of, of, of being placed in, in out-of-district placements, which is really a concern to all of us working on these cases. Um, many of these students, though, are actually new to our district. So I wanted to, to let you know that as well. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Questions for Dr. Einzel? Sandra, I think that's a, a, a good Sorry. overview of um, the thoughtfulness that we put in. And I know, as you mentioned, you've been here only a couple of years now? It's two years this year. Um, this. But I really appreciate you going through some of the programs and resources that you're tapping to help us treat these um, students as importantly as they should be. And I appreciate, Bill, you sharing uh, Mr. Othelet's letter that, you know, this is an important part of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of cost that goes into educating these folks. The single biggest line that Bill shared with us last week is around transportation and tuition. Mm -hmm. Can you offer us some thoughts about what that entails, what that covers? Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a negotiable item that we no, can present no, in our budget. No. Um, where, where, where do a lot of these students go? Maybe you can just provide a little more well, detail. I think that they go it. to a variety. There's a, um, programs throughout. They have to be approved programs by the state. And um, once they're approved by the state, the rate setting commission um, determines the rate. So each year you can go to the, uh, it's to the um, fiscal, um, I can't remember what the, the exact, exact agency is, but you, you can get a printout of then what each um, program will be costing you, whether it be a, a, um, a school year, a full year, or residential. Um, some of these programs are collaborative, um, which is kind of, of an extension of a public school system. They, they exist in um, public schools or, or on the grounds of public schools. And then there's private schools that are substantially separate than um, a public school setting. And um, once the rate is set, these private schools um, have the opportunity to actually ask for a rate increase and they have to go through a process of why they need that rate increase. So um, each year we plan for a certain, um, if, what, wherever our students are going, and they'll be, um, we'll, they'll be noted whether that school has asked for a rate. So we can plan for a certain rate, but we also have to understand that if they, if they have um, requested a, an in increase, that we have to be prepared to maybe add another two or three percent depending on what that is. We just received um, a letter from I think the state um, asking us to uh, attend a, um, a um, discussion right. about wh whether one of our, whether the, the program that our, uh, some of our students attend um, should have that increase. And that's the first time I've ever seen actually someone ask us to have a discussion of, of um, whether they should have the increase or not. But w do we have a choice in, in, in the rate we pay? No. No. And, and I think, uh, to add to that, virtually all of our students are in different programs. So we, we're not, and it really is the students' needs. So the program, you don't pick the program and then you know, figure out what student you're going to put in there. You take the student and say, what's the best program for that student? Um, so we don't have a, a grouping of students going to a similar program. Uh, we do obviously use the BICO program, which we belong to, um, right. and we have a number of students that are in that program. Uh, which and that's is, why we belong to right. a collaborative, so that we can pay a member rate. Right. Those rates are actually set by the board of directors, which are the superintendents. Mm -hmm. right. But once you go beyond right. the BICO collaborative, the rates are set by agencies that control private special education schools. And the second component to that under the BICO arm is that we do the transportation through the BICO program. Uh, where the business managers and superintendents mm -hmm. basically negotiate um, 
a, a program with outside uh, carriers to, to try to you know keep our cost in line and what we've done is teamed up uh, with obviously all of the other communities that are in the bico uh, community so that transportation contract is nearly a four million dollar contract versus just our portion mm. uh, which obviously we would have a harder time getting better pricing on sure. so um, that's you know we, we try in, in probably all of these cases to be as efficient as we can while providing the best services we can um, but there's limitations to how far you can go right. with that. Sure. And those, that was your, it is mandated by federal law that transportation and tuition be uh, provided locally. And, and also, if there's a move-in, you are responsible once they move here. So we have had a number of move-ins that have um, certainly increased our numbers. I'm aware of two students over the years that have um, actually lived in their school setting. Um, Monday residential. Through. Yep. Yeah, it's residential, so we're responsible for that entire payment yes. also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Tina. Some, I, th oh, I was going to just say that sometimes in uh, residential, it depends. We can sometimes cost share with the Department of um, um, Families and Children's Services, and sometimes we can cost share with um, DMH. Okay. So um, it depends on how the student ended up in a residential program. Okay. Yeah. It's usually like a Monday through Friday, and they come home on the weekends. Sometimes, uh, it sometimes depends. they stay. Yeah. Sometimes depends. they stay. Yeah. Right. Okay. It depends on the program. Known yeah. Several different ones. Okay. I, would, I just wanted to say, I think my biggest takeaway from Sandra's presentation is what a, a thoughtful and deliberative process this is for our students and how diligently our special ed department is working to give our students the services they need in-house and that the decision to send our students out of district is one that is made um, after much yes. thought and deliberation and only when it is truly a need that cannot be met within our district. And I mean, I think the, the costs speak for themselves. They, they are high, but it's because these are needs that are, are very serious and mm -hmm. we cannot meet and we are required to, yes. to do this. So yes. I, I appreciated your presentation and I think it's very clear how hard our department is working to meet the needs within, within our school system, but you know, there are just some needs we can't. Right. deal with here and it is time. true that sometimes you experience I mean there's always an ebb and flow <laughs> we were talking about this today yes. ebb and flow of students who need more and and then maybe for a few years where you have fewer students that need more right. adult support but so I think all districts experience that ebb and flow yeah. but everyone um, we've been lucky to avoid this but I think that everyone at some point experiences unanticipated special education costs and that's really where we are now where this was not anticipated but it's here now and it will be here still um, next year as well so I think that's what you're seeing in the increases unanticipated special ed costs and it is certainly the hot topic at the superintendents level our I think I mentioned our uh, superintendents conference in July was entirely focused on mental health and social emotional supports for students and how that's a growing problem. The superintendent's midwinter meeting at the end of January is also focused on the same topic because this, this is what has, is the highest effect, I'd say the hottest affecting mm -hmm. factor going on in public education right now is that growing need. So I think we're finally experiencing it to the level maybe others already have. It's <coughs> not easy, Unfortunately, but it's yeah. unanticipated. Steve? I'm going to pretend I know what the heck I'm talking about here, but I don't. But I noticed in the in the in the Bico uh, agenda item coming up, the mm -hmm. uh, the ABA yes. um, uh, opportunities for professional professional development, which brings me to what the doctor said earlier that we're also preparing for capacity. But to Deb's point about the fluid nature of the population in our mm -hmm. curriculum that we're supporting um, is really capability. So as the numbers change, the capability needs to be as strong as I am, and, and these opportunities are there. Am I correct? Like mm -hmm. the ABA, the uh, what do they call it? Applied behavioral, behavioral analysis, analysis mm -hmm. right? Again, I don't know yeah. anything about what that is, but that's it more seems of a like shift relevant in training. the training um, source. Oh, okay. So we we do employ um, uh, educational assistants mm -hmm. who are. Um, who have behavioral training, mm -hmm. and, they, and that, that's an extra um, skill set that we prize very highly. Yes. Um, and what's, what you see in the BICO, so I'm glad you can get me a little heads up, which this is actually better to talk about in context. Mm, right. What BICO is doing is they are supporting and encouraging a new uh, source for the training called 
RBT, Registered Behavior Technician. It's a little bit more involved than the old ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. It's 40 hours of training, so it's a little more um, rigorous, and you have to refresh each year. And that, before <coughs> you have the ABA training, that kind of did it for a lifetime. But as we know, we learn more and more about behavior modification and behavior, behavioral supports in public schools. So they are supporting and helping us shift the training to this new venue, which hopefully will pay off dividends to be a little bit more, um, I will say, in-depth and hopefully more effective. But that's what's being recommended now in the field of uh, behavioral supports is the registered behavior technician certification for paraprofessionals rather than the old ABA. So we'll see if that pays off. But we, uh, as public schools in the BICO Collaborative, we, are all, we all agreed last month that we're all going to switch to this as the new training uh, thing that we'll be encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Any other uh, comments for Dr. Einzel? No, I'll, I'll let go. What Tina said, I really appreciate you coming in. You know, it was, uh, I, I guess I asked for a, a somewhat brief but summary kind of presentation. I think you delivered that. And Good. I think, I think the reason why I asked for it was not because any of us question the importance or the, the need to have this in our budget, but I think when we go to the town and ask for a budget increase, and this is one of the larger items, it's just important that we have, mm -hmm. have examined it and understand it and uh, sure. have a public opportunity to comment on it. So, uh, But I certainly come away with the same reaction Tina referenced, and I think we all feel that, you know, you're doing a thoughtful job and it's the right thing to do and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I thought that was a great summary. Thank you. I, I think, too, that if I could just add one more thing, that I always try to think if I were listening at home and I'm not in education and how would I, how should I be thinking about this? We often talk about additions to our budget that it would be nice to have versus we need to have. This is a must-do. Right. Yeah. No option. This isn't a nice or a need. It, it's really a must-do. It's a federal law. Yeah. So... I think it makes it a little bit more and, palatable. And, and yet, and I totally agree, and yet, you know, it's fair for the public to say, well, why is the school system asking for another almost 4% increase, and what are we getting out of it programmatically? And, um, you know, our goal is always level service, high quality, bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. But you're right, this is a must-do, and this year it's one that's going to cost us a little bit more than it has in the recent past. Right. Uh, it's actually been extremely stable for a number of years, as Deb pointed out, that we haven't seen this increase like other communities have. So for probably the last four or five years, our, our numbers that are out of district or, you know, in special programs have been really pretty consistent. Um, so this is, you know, this is kind of like the first wave of getting hit with it. And that's, you know, again, that's why we're, we're seeing kind of the financial difference than, you know, um, what we've seen in the past. But... You know, again, I think you know one of the biggest advantages this community has had is it's it's had um, for a number of years a desire to have in-house programs, and by doing that, we've also been at, at occasions having students from other districts tuition into us, mm -hmm. uh, which has helped to make our cost uh, a little bit more efficient. Right. And, and so, again, I think being progressive in this field and, and having Sandra and, and the team basically working to to do the best thing for the kids we can internally also sometimes gives us a, a side advantage where. Uh, we can mitigate our cost a little by mm -hmm. by doing something for another district that's local to us. So, I guess the other thought I'll just add is, <clears throat> and this all is under the spirit of you know philosophy on budget, which is the season we're in. But you know, I continue to, even having been at this table for a few years, I continue to deepen my appreciation for what Foxborough school system really is, which is a school system that tries to serve every student and mm -hmm. find a fit for every student. And and you've been a key part, Deb, in helping me really appreciate what that means. It's easy to say, um, but I think that we, I, I do believe in my heart, we do as good a job as we can with that as our objective in as cost affordable manner as yes. possible. And um, I, I uh, you know, many of us at this table are taxpayers and, uh, you know, none of us like to see the budget go up. Mm -hmm. um, but I can sit here and feel very comfortable, that at least at what we're, where we're at in the process this year and what we're asking for, and as explained through Sanders' presentation, um, we're being as responsible as we can and sticking to that notion that we are a school system that provides an opportunity for every student. Correct. I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so another part of the budget process is the uh, capital improvement plan that we review every year. And Bill, thank you in advance for mm -hmm. having assembled your initial thoughts on our 
1617 capital improvement plan request, which I guess you're going to present to us initially here tonight. Okay, in your package, you know, you initially had what we, we do, which is a five year projection forward of, of the CIP uh, needs or requests. Um, I always give you the previous year that was funded so you can see what that is. But um, our, our CIP tends to be static in some senses that there are a number of items that we have to deal with every single year. Um, the computer hardware and software uh, and network upgrade cost, um, that's been a program that's been in place since 2010. Um, and it's helped to actually advance our system um, on a regular basis and to maintain what we have uh, in, in our computer uh, equipment. Uh, as you know, we, we run our own bus fleet. We have 22 full-size buses, five uh, mini buses uh, that we use in rotation. Uh, we're transporting uh, close to 2,000 students uh, across the district on the three different levels. Um, and we obviously use the, um, the mini buses to also uh, service our, our special needs children um, from pre-K all the way up. Um, we do have our own copying uh, capability within the district and so we have a constant replacement on that. Um, the IGO paving and curbing is a, is a one-off, um, the top four basic standard items. Um, what we did last last two years actually, but last year made the best uh, advantage of it is we had a little bit of money left over at the end of the year and we were able to uh, glom onto the town's um, paving program that they were doing with the roads and use their contracts and their processes and it, and it saved us a lot of money and we were able to actually do a, a fair amount of it, but we have a little bit left uh, as we'll discuss on that to do to complete the IGO. And then the final thing is the, the comment that uh, Deb had made last week where um, we have actually are expecting to get invited into the uh, MSBA's process for the borough school and with that comes a certain financial commitment that has to be made very early in the process uh, in order to continue so um, I from a timing point of view it's kind of we fortunately got the notice when we did so that we can get it in with our CIP budget uh, process and, and let it flow through to town meeting uh, and that meets the time requirements so we'll be okay So as far as the computer hardware, um, as I said, it's started in, in 2010. It's been a recurring article each year. It has changed a little bit. Originally, it was strictly to buy uh, new computer uh, equipment for the, the, um, the different uh, classrooms or labs um, throughout the district. Uh, we now uh, obviously have fairly significantly advanced our technology throughout the district with the interactive whiteboards, with projectors like you're, we're using tonight. Uh, with network capability, with uh, wireless capability, uh, servers, uh, you know, the entire nine yards. And, and while most of it is used for our side, we obviously still have a fair component that we share with the town as well. Uh, the whole infrastructure backbone is ours uh, at, the, at the school level here. Uh, we now have close to 1,700 PCs throughout the district. A lot of that increase came from the uh, growth in our um, computers on wheels are the, the cow uh, setups that we use throughout the schools now. Uh, every school has those from the elementary up. Uh, it has helped us to significantly increase the accessibility of, of um, you know, computers to the children and, uh, on the different levels. And obviously one of the final benefits will be, depending on how standardized testing moves forward, uh, it would give us some more capability there. And as I said, the final thing is a, a tremendous amount of software support that we, we have to develop internally, network and server upgrades uh, on an annual basis. So the money, while similar uh, for the last you know X five, six years, um, has been really morphed into having to service a lot more needs. Um, and fortunately, as pricing has come down, it's given us that capability of moving forward there. School bus replacement, um, as I said, what we try to do here is uh, keep buses to 10 years less than 10 years old uh, and under 100,000 miles. We have two uh, full-size buses of 2005 and 2006 uh, model year uh, that will be approaching the 100,000 miles. Obviously they are, uh, one's 11 years and one's 10 years. Uh, they are the two oldest in the fleet uh, that we would like to take out. Um, we have a minibus uh, M8 which is a 2007 but already has 112,000 miles on it. Um, and you know, what we have done, uh, you know, while we have uh, 
extra buses, we try to rotate buses on a regular basis so that obviously we're not wearing one bus down quickly and then having to replace them faster. Um, so by having a few extra on both the full size and the minis, it really helps when we either have breakdowns, regular service, or uh, additional needs. And a lot of that's field trips, you know, sports athletic trips and stuff like that. We can handle all within our own uh, system. So uh, you're looking at basically uh, two buses on the full size at about uh, 78,000 a piece and the, the mini bus at about 57, and that would be a net of a trade. Um, trades range every year. Um, 3,000 seems to be the average. A couple years ago, we got real lucky. We got 6,000 a piece. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you know what, what's happening is with most of these trades, they're going overseas, or not overseas, they're going to Mexico um, and south of the border because they don't want to have the liability in the, in the country. Again, it's a 10-year-old vehicle. Um, and you know, so last year, the two of them just were driven away. Um, so that's why the values really aren't much there. We don't do three every year. Um, it seems to be every second or third year that we have the minibus that's in the configuration. Again, it's the size of the fleet. You've got, you know, three times, four times more on the full-size buses than you have on the, the mini size, and the rotation seems to work well that way. Copy re re uh, replacement. We do about 8 million copies a year. We have three vendors. All of them are on the state bid list um, that we deal with. We obviously bid them against each other uh, because there are certain features that each one can do and trade values uh, make a difference in some cases. Um, we've had extremely good luck with the fact that these uh, uh, state contracts all require these copiers to have three-year warranties, full service, uh, full maintenance. So for the most part, uh, the copiers will make it the full three years before we hit the, the number of copies that you know, would typically be a bad spot to be in, but we're not paying any maintenance for them. So we're effectively getting a good price on them up front with full maintenance uh, coverage for the three year period. Um, and typically based on the number of machines we have throughout the district and the number of copies we're making, we run around four machines a year, sometimes five if we get you know, a smaller one uh, in the mix. <laughs> Um, a new item, and we, we discussed this with the town side uh, with both Randy and Bill at a meeting, and they felt that uh, we should be pushing this into the CIP budget this year to move forward. Um, as you know, we started the Sam Burns Community Field Project uh, four years ago, um, you know, and the first year obviously was getting the turf field itself built. Um, come a couple years next, later, we, we install the lighting, so we've got the, the, the field and the lighting complete at this point. Um, and last spring, um, Deb Spinelli obviously was the spearhead of starting a fundraising organization to get moving on the concession and restrooms uh, for the field. Um, we're currently estimating um, $200,000, of which that fundraising already raised $25,000. Um, we feel that, you know, if, with the school committee's approval, we could use $50,000 of the um, school's uh, building uh, rental revolving account towards this. Uh, but that would still leave us with a requirement of $125,000. Um, ironically, you know, with the next two phases that come up, the eight-lane track and the uh, concession bleachers, without the concession stand with bathrooms, we're, we're virtually kind of stuck. So we've been trying to do everything in a, in a need process basis. So again, the turf field was the first. The lighting was the second because it gave us more access and use time on the, the, the field. This gives us the ability now to make the next move because without this, without bathrooms on the site, we can't put up the, the, the bleachers. Um, that would be a requirement um, to be able to handle the, the value of, of our number of people that would be coming. And to be honest with you, because of the way it has to be located, we've already done all the engineering with uh, Bay Colony doing our site layouts so that we truly understand what the site requirements are. Um, and getting this piece done before we do the next two pieces is, is kind of critical because we have a lot of underground utility issues that we have to deal with. Um, and we'd like to have that done before we get into doing uh, the track and the, and the, and the uh, bleachers. So. The other advantage, obviously, is the concession stands. It is one of the major support um, for any of the organizations that, that support our, our sports. Um, pretty much every organization, whether it's football, soccer, track, uh, all have a boosters club. Those boosters clubs put in a, a significant amount of financial resources into our, our district um, on an annual basis. I think people would be very surprised if they understood how much money each one of those boosters clubs puts uh, into the sports programs, as well as what happens on the youth sides, because obviously this field is also used by youth soccer, youth lacrosse, and they have their own organizations as well. So the concession stands not only serves what we need on a school full campus basis, but it also serves the community, again, the community field concept here, um, and the, the uh, fundraising capabilities of that, uh, of those groups. 
The Igo paving, as I said, this is kind of phase two of it. We've been fortunate to get uh, about 70% of all the parking done. I think if you remember last summer before we started, the back parking was absolutely in, in horrendous shape. Um, it was a safety concern. And quite honestly, when they were plowing, you'd watch the, the drivers almost go right through the windshields because they'd catch on parts of the uh, pavement that were uh, two different uh, levels. Um, so we were, we were very fortunate, as I said, to use the, the town surge bid. Um, and basically what I had done is I had already had two companies come out and actually price what it would cost to redo the entire IGO. Uh, the bids I got were in the $200,000 range. Um, last year and the year before when we did a little bit of, of paving and stuff around the, uh, the new playground, uh, to date we've only spent uh, about fifty-five to $60,000. Uh, with this, 32 will be less than 100. And you know, again, it's, it's a significant cost savings um, doing it this way using the town's resources but you know using some funding this way um, and it is something that we can do during the summer time frame the reason i'm pulling this one forward and not hoping that we might have some money at the end of the year based on budget savings is that i really need to commit on the granite curbing side in advance of the summer because it's such a long process to get that done and yeah. set first before we actually do our regular paving uh, process that i couldn't do it last year i couldn't do the section because i, I couldn't have to take the chance of not being ready by the time school started so um, you know, so that's that's one of the issues. But and it's you know again, it's thirty-two thousand five hundred is inclusive of, of the curbing and the uh, paving. The other side is we're replacing everywhere we do this type of work. We're replacing um, concrete curbing, which deteriorates. Um, I think if you remember the high school a number of years ago, it was literally the fact that more people didn't get hurt was kind of amazing. The IGO was the same way in the front. Uh, where the kids were getting off the buses it was it was very uneven edges crumbling off the sides and we've gone to granite curbing and while that's a little bit more expensive that has a lifetime uh, you know which is significantly longer than anything you're going to do in a in a grant in a concrete product so we're trying to be very thoughtful in what we do from a maintenance perspective as well uh, to reduce costs down the road is uh, in the process um, as far as the MSBA study um, the Basically, you know, we've applied through the school committee for the last three years with the MSBA. Um, last year, we got very close, and we were on the wait list, uh, or on the short list, I guess. We didn't quite make, uh, make it in. Um, the Burl School itself is 47 years old. We've discussed it a number of times. The amount of significant issues within the HVAC systems, as well as all of the structural components, windows, doors, um, you know, is, is really... Um, once you start the process, you really every every step you take creates uh, another issue that you have to resolve. Uh, one of the biggest problems we've always had there is it's it's not ADA compliant. Uh, we've done small things to try to make doorways and and certain access points uh, workable, but they do not meet any of the standards that are out there today. And also, one of the things that that we know um, is our pre-K program, which again, if the state continues to follow through with its uh, quest towards pre-K. Uh, will be a bigger issue down the road, but we feel that if we could add two rooms to that building, um, it serves a couple of points. First of all, we don't have the appropriate room design for the pre-K program, which has a lot of special needs um, components to it, a lot of therapy issues, a lot of you know special trainings, and, and I think Sandra could speak to that probably even better than I can. And as a as a matter of fact, Sandra and I will be going to a couple districts who have put in new pre-K. Uh, rooms to, to basically study them to see what would be the best thing that we can do in this. But the other problem with the building is because a lot of the, the rooms have bathrooms in between each room, they are not handicap accessible. They're very hard for a teacher to be able to maneuver within and as deal with the students that need them. Um, so my assumption is going to be in the, in the program process here is that we actually, the, the building has one set of gang labs which aren't meeting any of the codes either. Um, that we will more than likely have to build a second set on the other end of the building, uh, which will mean that we're going to lose classroom space there. So I think the, the our our feeling at this point is that you know even with the enrollment that's in that building, the two additional classrooms and the redesigning of some of the spaces that we have, um, we think this will make this building again you know a, a long-term keeper uh, for the town. And from what we can see structurally, the building is in fine shape. The town uh, has done a great job supporting us with. Uh, repaving, recurbing, um, you know, doing everything we could do on the outside of the building before we actually attack the inside. So that will save us money in the end. That will be cost that we're not going to incur again because uh, we won't do any damage to that. Um, the way the process has been managed so far, as Deb said, she received a call uh, that basically mm -hmm. said that we were 
uh, being considered to be pushed forward to um, the MSBA's board. Uh, she received a follow-up call saying that they have put us on the list to come forward, uh, which means the board at their January meeting will review the, the list that their staff has given them. Um, I have a strong assumption that obviously if the staff is recommending a, a group of, of schools that the, that the board, unless they find some significant problem with our request, uh, would move us forward. Uh, and again, that puts us into the scenario that um, it's a, basically it's a 270 day paperwork process time where we have a lot of work that we have to do um, to show our needs and, and develop it. But during that process, we also have to show that we will come up with the funding to be able to do the full feasibility study, which means we, at that point, after the 270 days, we will have to hire the architect, hire the OPM, and actually build a feasibility study on the building. Um, ironically, it's almost the same process that we're doing with the town hall. We're doing all of that development stuff up front and showing how our educational program, you know, this building will serve that program going forward. And if, if the MSBA agrees with that, then we go back to the town with the final design and the final request for approval of funding. Um, and so I, it's, it's a little bit different program than we've ever done on, on the MSBA in the past, but again, um, it's still subject to their reimbursement side. So I'm estimating based on a couple conversations I've had uh, with other school districts uh, that the, the total cost would be 600, which is what we would have to recommend at town meeting. However, we would get reimbursed on that 600 by whatever the uh, regulated portion that the reimbursement rate would be. Uh, last time it was around 49%. Mm -hmm. um, I know they're not quite as generous uh, on that, but uh, in talking to one district just uh, today, they were at like 46 percent, very similar district to us. I'm assuming that that you know we would probably be up in that in that range as well. Um, and you know that I you know that number may change a little bit between now and your final meeting of this month, just based on me trying to have more conversations with the state and with other districts, just to make sure where their numbers are coming from and, and where ours should come from as well. Um, so I think that's that's a it's a big component. Again, we've been apprising the town side, so it's not you know Randy and, and Bill know um, where we are with this program at this point, um, and they understand that again it's it's reimbursable, uh, you know, up to close to the 50% range. So, um, and then again, it will come down to the final thing at the end that if everybody in the community agrees with the process, you know, whether they agree going forward with the the full renovation in addition. So I kind of broken into the two components, basically our annual CIP cost of, of the 585, 500, and the borough project of 600,000 with a total request of 1,185,500. Uh, again, there are different components to this uh, as to how it will be funded on the town side. Um, again, the, the, the project on the borough side will be voted at 600, but the assumption is funding only a little over 300. Um, so even though we have to state it this way, uh, again, it's a, it's a, a component of the, the MSBA kind of being sure that everybody understands clearly what the, the cost that is being done. But as you move forward with that 600, they reimburse you as you go. Mm -hmm. So uh, the town does not need to uh, develop a funding source for 600,000 uh, in, in the process. And that's it. Okay. Questions, Questions for Bill? Bill, I have uh, one that if I can borrow the words from my colleague, one of the colleagues to my left, I'm going to say I'm going to ask a question that I know nothing about, but um, I'm not going to say whether it was Marilyn or Steve, but yeah. Don't um, use names. I Don't it. use I names. Don't use all. names. You know, just <laughs> when that ever happens to me, I'm not saying it out loud. <laughs> and Steve does turn the most lovely shade of pink when you say these things. It, it's just wonderful. Um, <laughs> concession stand and bathrooms, two hundred thousand dollars. For some reason, when I was going through this today, I was thinking, is it really two hundred thousand dollars to put up a building and do the plumbing? But clearly, it is. Can you just help me understand that? Yeah. Actually, Attleboro spent three hundred, so I'll, I'll make it feel a little bit better. Than okay, so well, that's important. So Attleboro <laughs> spent three hundred thousand on concession stand and bathrooms. The, the way the the biggest cost factor um, is dealing with all of the the utility side of it. We probably will, uh, in this process, uh, soak up fifty to sixty thousand dollars just getting the um, 
the sewer lines, the power lines. That's now we, we tried to upfront some of the power thing by when I built the um, the shed for the lighting, I actually already brought in the power for the concession stand as well. Um, so that we just have to go from there, but we still have to go from there into yeah. this and, and put panels and electrical in that side. Um, but the water, um, you know, and the, the, the sewer lines and stuff, because we have to cross all the way through to get to the school to make those items work, um, there's some significant cost involved there. Yeah. And there's then no just sewerage out there yeah, at all, yeah. as we all know. Yeah, and, the, and then the obvious thing is when you get into bathroom facilities themselves, um, the design and development of those in an exterior environment. So <coughs> let's, let's all remember that this is a building that doesn't have all the protections that the school has or that the town hall or any other building has where people are in it all the time and stuff so this has to be a building that's designed and built um, from almost i now don't want to say in, in you know indestructible because the kids will prove me wrong on it but um you know has to be one that can is extremely durable and easy to maintain and so because of that you end up doing more things in block uh, mm -hmm. block interior walls and things like that which are more much more expensive than doing just similar you know si uh, simple partitions that are wood or, or metal so um, <clears throat> so it ends up getting a little bit beefed up as far as the building goes the concession side of it also has its own uh, issues relative to Ansel systems and requirements for you know any kind of cooking that they would do in there to meet the codes um, you know we're not talking about buying all the equipment because a lot of the um, you know the youth groups buy their own refrigeration buy their own stuff that way but we have to have it all developed and, and put in place so that any of the major functions would be covered in that. Um, and the third component that we'd actually like to make this building, like do all three things, would be that one end of it also would be the ticket uh, booth type of setup. So it would go, as you come in the side, it would be the ticket thing there, you come around the concessions there, you go around the other end, it's the bathrooms. Right. And so the building basically encompasses three functions. Um, it's not real, real large, to your point, but it's much more... Yeah, well, there's a lot of systems involved. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, from my viewpoint, it's something that we want to do right. Because if you think about um, the public, other teams from other communities typically go over to Hearn Fields, track, football field for events. And we've gotten a lot of comments from people from other towns who say, are you serious? This is where you hold all your events? And we have to walk in, inside the school and find a bathroom in there. We have to have the school unlocked when the, when the facility is being used, even on the weekends. And this turf field should be able to be used by a community sort of self-sufficiently. And so we don't want, uh, you know, and, and that's been the case up at the Ahern for, what, two or three generations, maybe longer? And everyone's always sort of accepted it here in Foxborough. But when you go elsewhere, you are used to having restroom facilities on the campus that people can access publicly. So it, it is a, a higher ticket item, but we need to do it right. We don't want to make the same mistake and have facilities at the high school that is not accessible to the public with and rentable because uh, it doesn't make any sense to do that again where you have to unlock a school and have people go in there and then try to lock off the rest of the building so that when it's open for that that we have to have custodians there we have to have um, you know people uh, restricted within that building so it needs to be independently self-sufficient so it does require a lot of they have to be able to cook in there serve in there um, it'll prevent the, the temporary ticket table, if you will, that we're used to now and uh, be able to have money in a safe place, think, which we don't have now, and lots of other things that we The ADA have. compliant, right? Yes. Yeah. I think listening to all the systems you went through, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking it's more than just a building. It, it is. The it's, one they built yeah. out there, was that the recreation department that built that, or is it the town? The contractor built that one. Okay. Yeah. But this one's going to be bigger, obviously. Uh, it's actually similar in size okay. uh, to that one. Uh, oh, no, not the, the one over here. I'm thinking about the one on Payson Road. I'm sorry. No, I'm thinking. Uh, no, no, yeah, no, no. Yeah, no, no. It's, I yeah. wasn't even thinking of that. That's, that's only a small that's component totally of different. it. That's totally different. Okay. Yeah, small How many component bathrooms component. are you talking about? Uh, already worked out with the building inspector. We're going to have to have six on each side. On each side. Yeah. Um, also, with handicap facilities. With yeah. handicap, yes. with okay. you know sinks. And, yes. and, this is you know, significant. Oh, okay. This is not a small. That, no, you're you're looking snapshot. at a stadium that ba basically yeah. should be able to hold probably somewhere between a thousand uh, and fifteen hundred. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. all the numbers are based on that. Uh, ironically, the building code doesn't have a specific code for stadiums. Um, so what he did was did some he did a significant amount of research, but he also kind of went and, and double checked with yeah with Rentham on how they designed what theirs mm -hmm. was going to be and stuff like that. And he kind of came to the same conclusion that it was reasonable. So 
you know, that's basically 12, you know, 12 fixtures, 12 sinks, you know. Right. Um, Thank you. Kind of expands yeah. the scope. And I, think, I got it. Oh, I'm yeah. educated I now. think our goal as a good community yeah, partner you know, is to make, this, to make this facility rentable as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And with the concession stand, it will be rentable for we'll events, even in. without the, the, the track and the bleachers, okay. that we can start um, helping our community create that um, maintenance and replaceable uh, account where it'll be self-sufficient yep. and financially. Yep. <coughs> okay. Any other thing, any other questions for Bill? Okay. Bill again. Thank you, Bill. From Bill to Bill. Yep. Bill, Bill you don't need a motion to approve the CIP proposal. You typically do it by the end of the year, uh, by the end of the, the <coughs> along with the regular budget. Uh, Not yet. Budget. You don't need tonight unless you guys are comfortable with it. But oh, do you, I, we usually do it at the public yeah. hearing. Correct. Okay. Okay. FY16 budget update. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. As as you know, we already discussed the fact that we're mm -hmm. running into an issue with what our budget uh, for the special needs. Um, outplacement tuitions and, and transportation uh, are going to be this year um, at this point we're projecting about two hundred thousand dollars over uh, what we had budgeted for um, I went through all of the payroll uh, information with um, Jim McGowan who is our you know kind of our payroll supervisor and we kind of scoured every account through each of the processes that we know of at this point for any kind of um, you know, changes that were done from the beginning of the year to now and what we project uh, to go through. Um, so you're going to see, um, we already talked about some of the adjustments, uh, the borough school, uh, obviously the, um, the teaching position and EAs that we didn't, or e that we didn't fulfill. Um, the, this total savings there is about 180,000. However, we did shift one of those positions over to the IGO. Um, it was a newer position, so the, the value was less than the one that retired. Um, so that we picked up 55,000 in cost there. Um, we have uh, a 0.5 FTE teacher at the uh, Taylor, uh, which also is not in next year's budget, uh, was one of the things that Deb already talked about. So, but we didn't hire it this year because we didn't feel we needed it. So we've got a $42,000 savings. That was the half-time kindergarten. Right. Um, you know, and again, I think it's important to, to point out to the residents that even though we get it, we have to obviously we do our budget nearly a year in advance. Um, but even though we get that uh, at the time we do, we don't lock down and don't commit to any positions throughout until we actually know what our numbers are going to be. Um, and that is one of the reasons that we give money back to the town every year. Um, last year was about forty-seven thousand that we gave back, um, and you know. We still look at obviously needs that we have within the district to try to, to deal with those first, but you know the money does go back because we don't just spend it. You know, we, we deal with what we need to deal with. Um, in the special needs area, we had some reductions in at assistance, which basically saved us about twenty-four thousand. Uh, and it wasn't really the positions dropping; it was new hires of positions at lower rates um, that that affected that the most. Um, but we also had that offset of about a 0.5 um, psychologist at the Ahern, so that was a $22,000 cost, so our net savings was about 1800 in that area. As I said, the tuition line, um, we're looking at about a $206,000 increase if everything hits as it's currently projected. Um, we have um, an $8,000 uh, cost that you, um, you didn't see this before an eight thousand dollar cost and this is our share um i think uh, deb spoke to this last uh, period with the uh what the ymca is doing there was with all the equipment that they were replacing there was three pieces that they couldn't commit on their side to do uh, that were an issue um and we were able to negotiate a fairly good rate on this so um you know we feel that it's our responsibility to fund that eight thousand uh, dollars into the wellness program um, on top of what we're already going to get from the Y, it's going to be quite a quite a facility. Um, again, the twenty-seven thousand um, dollar technology position we've already discussed. Um, that's shared with the town, and it's it's um, our support position, a part-time position there. Um, 
transportation uh, we've we've already pulled 24,000 out of our vehicle fuel expense line which is doing very well and hope to be able to pull some more out of there before the year end if we have any other issues um, <coughs> the plant operation side is where we spent that 24,000 basically just under 25,000 for a new vehicle for the for the vehicle that the uh, town garage basically told us to take off the road um, and then the final piece to this is that, um, and this is a point that I think I've made to this committee a number of times, that our ability to maintain um, our revolving accounts and even the use of our circuit breaker with a uh, kind of a one-year leeway in it is exactly for this purpose. And this is exactly the problem that you could run into and not you know, be able to deal with. Um, so what we're going to do is take 100000 out of that uh, circuit breaker account um, we had budget for 475. We're going to take 575. It will still leave us with about 475 in that account. Um, and again, I think that's uh, a prudent way to, to go through this process. Um, it's exactly what that fund's supposed to be spent on. So it's it's 100% appropriate. Um, and again, you know, if you did not maintain the philosophy that you've maintained as far as uh, the revolvers and the circuit breakers and, and the different um, accounts we have that way. Uh, you would be looking for another hundred thousand dollars somewhere right now hmm. and that basically will get us to a, um, a favorable condition of just under twenty seven thousand um, dollars we obviously at this point our salary lines were pretty comfortable with because um, you don't have many swings there although I will say the um, the water must be very good at the urn because <coughs> we have a lot of pregnancies, um, which has a, a separate cost. The high school towards. as well. Um, it's been a banner year for <laughs> 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 high school. Uh, so that has, that, there's a positive and a negative. This, in some cases, obviously, um, there's a savings to money because they're off for a period of time that's, that's longer and we're hiring in uh, short-term subs and, and, and long-term subs. On the other side, sometimes you'll have a teacher that actually is out and you're not only paying that side of it, but the, the long-term subs. So it can, it can go against you both ways, but there's a, it's a high number this year. Um, right. But we still feel comfortable that we're, we're able to manage that within our budgets as, as they stand today. So You'll still see some adjustments going forward, but it's way too early as far as the utility cost and, and some supply lines and stuff like that. Um, but we're fairly comfortable, again, that uh, if any of those, most of them will be on a favorable side, not, not on a negative side to us. So we still have a little cushion if something else comes up or these numbers end up being a little bit more aggressive than they are today. Any questions for Bill? I actually have a question. Just um, yeah, on the um, FY16 CIP request, just going back with oh, yeah. the, the integrated security system, mm -hmm. I was wondering where we stand with that. Contracts have been signed for um, the entire security system. Mm -hmm. um, it's a two-piece, uh, two-component thing. It's obviously your access, door control access pieces, mm -hmm. um, and then it's all your cameras and, and stuff. That's all been signed. We're... Um, Expecting the first parts of the equipment to probably come in with the next uh, before the end of January, um, and then it will be a kind of a, a build from there. Um, and uh, you know, along with that, the phone system is also going <coughs> at the same time. So we have some very large projects that the IT department is going to be dealing with, as well as school uh, issues. Um, but we did do a, we did hire an outside firm in both cases to mm -hmm. do the majority of the work. So it's they're just going to be managing the process and how it interconnects with our systems. So it's all in process now. Everything's been signed and on its way. I have one other question. I know there was some damage to the the field behind the IGO school. Mm -hmm. Who, whose responsibility for pay? Uh, whose responsibility is that field? That well, the majority of that field is that. actually funded through the uh, Tree and Park. Um, department's budget yeah um, there in a lot of these fields where we share access to mm -hmm. we also um, part of our maintenance budget also helps to fund um, you know the cost of, of keeping the fields up so there I quite honestly I don't think on that particular field it's ours um, you know but on almost any of the other fields that are on our school properties we, we do fund quite a bit of it to them um, I think the you know the the real issue there, quite mm -hmm. honestly, is that it, it's a shame because the field had mm -hmm. just been worked on, mm -hmm. um, and some good money had been spent mm -hmm. on reseeding and, and you know fertilizing and top dressing and everything. Um, yeah. And now in the spring, instead of having something you know immediately uh, yeah. on a positive side, we're going to have to go out and do some repair work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the tree and park is a little, little 
you know, kind of disgusted with it. But they should be. Um, it's horrible. You know. Yeah. I only wish the kid got stuck, and then we would know who it was. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm sorry for the random questions, but no I problem. was I was curious about that myself. So, and thank you for the update on the cameras and the mm -hmm. security system. And thank you for being diligent on that. So I do need a vote on the um, budget summary update. I will would. move to approve the FY16 budget summary statement update. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 4-0. Thank uh, Jimmy for us, Bill, for the detail in that. We can start to see it's getting a little more detailed as you present it, so it's coming into focus, which is great. Okay, BICO quarterly report. Yep. So as you know, uh, the, it is now uh, part of the state regulations that you receive a quarterly report from whatever collaborative for special education purposes that we belong to. So um, I think um, Dr. Rubert's great about providing those uh, quarterly updates for us, including the successful audit recently. I think the two highlights were the um, a, a registered behavior technician that we've already discussed. And the other thing is that they've really worked hard to expand their professional development offerings, especially to support districts for that sheltered English immersion uh, certification or uh, endorsement, if you will, um, that teachers will need for the next round of licensure. So there are two routes to that, either by taking sheltered English immersion uh, professional development or by taking the, um, the MTEL, the teacher test for teaching English language learner students. Some of our teachers are going that route. So one of the latest things that they are offering in addition to the SEI administrator course, which Amy actually arranged for us on site last year, so all of our administrators took it at once. But many, um, if not most, administrators in the other member districts have not had it. So they are sponsoring the SEI administrator course, the MTEL, SEI prep course <coughs> for teachers who want to go the, the test taking route and then the long uh, teacher endorsement course which will lead to that endorsement for their licensure. So uh, that's been a great help what they're doing to support their needs. So that's the quarterly update. Okay. Thank you. Acceptance of donation. Well as of today we actually have two. So in the interest of supporting the Sam Burns community field, the first donation that we had planned on offering you tonight it would be from the Gardner family. Oh, I was hoping this would be buried amongst many. $500 <laughs> toward the Sam Burns Field concession stand fundraiser. So we are actually, if you accept this donation, $500 to the good. So uh, let's deal with that first. Uh, you want to just put that in context? We've received, what, about $19,000, if I remember, ballpark? Uh, we're, we're probably uh, at more close to the $25,000 range because we've, so, we've sold T-shirts. Yep. And we've had um, other fundraiser things other than the donations that you, you're referencing that you've accepted almost $20,000 in donations. This would probably put us right up to that. Yep. So uh, it's been a very, I'd say it's only been what, eight months since we started fundraising. So we had a, a pretty decent spring with all the fundraisers, and this certainly is one of the highlights of it. So I think in terms of the all the interest in town, and people are so good about supporting things in their community, that's the reason we put it forward for capital for the balance, because we feel that that's a great effort to show that this community support, and, uh, but we can't keep tapping the same people. So at some point, you say, this is the community has shown their support. Now we need to move it along ourselves for the rest. So. So yes, about 20,000 roughly in specific donations and then another close to 5,000 with us selling t-shirts and we had a booth at the Founders Day. <clears throat> We've had bowling. booths at we did the bowling. We bowling. bowled at Splitsville and we had um, yeah. a, a table at the election day <laughs> last April. So we, we've done a variety of things uh, toward that end. <clears throat> so if there are others who wanna make individual contributions, that is it too late terrific. to do that? Never too late to do it. It is I never too late to, to do it. accept with gratitude the uh, Gardner family donation to the Sam Burns Field and concession stand fundraiser. I will second Steve's motion. All those in favor? Aye. I'll abstain. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Michelle, Thank you, Michelle. Michelle and I are happy to, to, to add our name to some of yours that are already on the list, and uh, we were fortunate to to know Sam and our boys know Sam and we spend our share of time on that field it truly is a community field so it's our pleasure to to participate and our good fortune to be able to participate so uh, but if others feel similarly as we do that they're they've spent some quality family time out there and want to uh, contribute and join in uh, please feel free 
Terrific. Thank you very much. Very generous. Uh, so our second one that just came to my attention today, and I'm not sure what it's going to be used for, so I, was, I think I'm just going to mention it tonight, have you accept it, and then I'll, I will come back at another meeting, perhaps with this person. So um, Kara Griffin, who's the executive director of the Tritown Chamber of Commerce, which in the Tritown Chamber serves Fox Mansfield and Norton, um, has donated $774.85 to the Foxborough Schools initiatives regarding STEM, uh, any STEM initiative. So we actually had to call today to see if there's something in particular because it was such a specific amount. I thought they already were supporting something in mind, such as when Schneider Electric buys software for the high school. Indeed, we can use it for any STEM initiative that we choose. Oh, so I'm exciting. going to, uh, Janet spoke to her today. I, I know Kara myself. I'm going to call her and kind of get an idea. Um, she did give us ideas of what the other two communities she believes are purchasing it. But, you know, we may start with the computer science program. It's just my first thought because it's my goal. Give it an idea. Um, so, you know, well, we, we're going to have to support people in professional development next July. So far, I don't think there's a cost associated with that, but there probably is. So could be materials, curriculum materials. So there's so many things we have going on in STEM. So I'll, I'd like to come back and speak to our people and get a handle on what we'd like to support with it. And, ma and maybe have Kara from Tritown come because, you know, they do support a lot of what the schools do in many informal ways, some of which I probably don't even know about. So I, I think that was a terrific surprise and want to thank the Tritown Chamber of Commerce for their support of our three communities STEM programs, which is near and dear to their hearts as well. I think why the number looks a little specific, it was they did a fundraiser and they raised it and split they it between split three. It. That was what so I was saying. So it ended up just being the mathematical That's process like, yeah. of, of <laughs> divide by three. Is so that what so happened? Yeah. That's, That's what I would guess. Very generous. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, she and a couple board members would come and, and they do a, a mock check. But I thought you might be hearing about it in the other two communities who accept it. So I thought it might be best if you accept it. And then we'll do a little bit something more formal with them at an upcoming meeting. If that's okay. I move to accept the donation of seven hundred seventy four dollars and eighty five cents Correct. from the Tri Town Memory. Chamber of Commerce. I second that. Any further? All those in favor? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. With gratitude. With Absolutely. gratitude yes. and a needs analysis. True. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's great news. That's a, that's a good day when you Oh yes. Almost seven hundred and seventy five dollars to the richer I thought you were. Good Other stuff. matters? Yes. Oh, I always have a few. Um, one thing I did put in your packet is that we recently received notification that the Burrell Elementary School has been recognized by our State Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education as a 2015 Massachusetts Commendation School. Um, and their, their, their uh, certificate says for narrowing proficiency gaps. The letter that accompanied it said, um, from the commissioner said that they were recognized for its high achievement, high progress, and or narrowing proficiency gaps. So my guess is it's about narrowing proficiency gaps, but actually we can't find a lot of information on specifically what data they use. But we do know that they use the state testing mm -hmm. assessment system data. And uh, so whatever it is, they've done a great job over there at the Borough School, as all of our schools do. So that's a happy note. And I think that you know it's always wonderful to recognize people's hard work, especially when our state commissioner recognizes that they have made um, exceptional progress with their students this year. It was one out of 45 schools, don't they say? 45. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Yep, 45. It's always nice when our schools get recognition. Huh? Absolutely. Yes, so 45 schools across the state were recognized as commendation schools. So congratulations great. to the Borough School and Congrats Principal McCarthy and all the people who work there. Oh, do I have anything else? Happy New Year. <laughs> um, well, let's see. I don't think so. Nothing much has happened yet this week. It's only Monday. True. Tina? I have nothing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you better keep going. Amy, for to change their mind. <laughs> Steve? Nothing to report. Marilyn? I want to apologize for not being here at the last meeting, and a Happy New Year to everyone. Yeah. I'm good. You had enough air time, Bill? I was going to say, Well, I said at the beginning it was going to be a budget heavy. We'd like to congratulate our bevy. Yes. Yeah. We, we would like our to do that. Yes. If you would so officially. officially. Well. On the arrival of. You go ahead. Benjamin Sawyer Lord. Bevy is a grandma. She is. A beautiful a, a baby. Proud grandma. Good a for second her. one at Congratulations, the table Beverly. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Mm hmm. Um, I only had one thing and almost falls under uh, old matters. Um, 
but uh, the calendar and I don't want to get yes. into a lengthy calendar discussion it's not on our agenda mm -hmm. but we introduced it last mm -hmm. meeting and um, it might uh, require a request of a little bit of work okay. um, that might be helpful for the public prior to our next meeting but we had recently the experience on social media that I think was a little negative and we commented on that I publicly commented on it but I thought we, we had a really positive experience on social media recently with discussion of the calendar which I don't know if you've seen it, Deb, but I think it, I think it's a tribute to you putting it on the agenda for discussion and putting it out there for awareness because it has spawned some really good mm -hmm. discussion that I went through again today prior to the meeting, and I'm sure Tina's up to speed on it as our resident expert. Um, unfortunately, uh, the only conclusion I can draw from it is that this is one of those topics, as we know, that is really, really hard to get to consensus it on um, because there were some really valid points both ways mm -hmm. uh, and it's emotional and it's historic and it's yeah. legacy and it's passionate um, the only thought that occurred to me and I don't know if it's a good one um, would be could we come up with a third option um, we, you, you presented two very thoughtful options mind if I finish give me one minute um, I think going in August generates some real hesitation I think we saw some benefits, however, to going pre-Labor Day. Um, I wonder, I know, I know September 1st, I think, is a Thursday, and I think we usually take the Friday off. So it's hard to not start in August and still start before Labor Day. I wonder, I started looking at it a little bit, you guys can do it far more effectively than I can, whether there is a way to start in September before Labor Day, maybe take out a professional day or shorten or move it or something so that it, it's meaningful. I don't want to bring them in for a day or half a day to be gone three days and then what's the point I can kind of see that um, but I just wonder if there's a way we can be a little creative with our PD this year or the days that we typically recognize or something to try mm -hmm. to get to a middle uh, ground um, it, it's very hard I'll just say publicly it's very hard I understand because as I say I really believe the first isn't the first a Thursday. A Thursday. Yeah, so that's what I'm checking. So I, I don't know how, and I'm not asking you guys to answer it now. Mm. Um, but I, there, there were some advantages to starting pre Labor Day with a shorter week. There was some, we, you gave us some real good feedback. Right. Uh, I don't think it was quite as painful on the families as they thought maybe initially. It seemed like a good transition for students. But August, I think mm -hmm. people are really struggling with August. Okay. So I don't know that there's a way to do it. All right, but let me ask a question so I can come up with another option that you'd like to see. Um, because personally, I know people think I, I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what you decide, we will make it work, which is what I said last we year. Know we, will, we will make it work. And I, 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 think, I think there's, they're all good options and there's no terribly bad option. And either way, the kids will come to school and they'll be educated and they'll have a great start to the year, right. either way. So the third option would be, and I remember last year we had three options, and I didn't do that this year because of this, but uh -huh. let me ask, so let me make sure I understand it. So if, if they were to come back on September 1st, which is a Thursday, would you want to see students in school both Thursday and Friday? Because not having the four-day Labor Day weekend has been very unpopular. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, which, I mean, you can still create that option for discussion, and I, I appreciate your words because I think the more people discuss it, the more they at least realize that the the thoughtfulness was thorough it, it I don't I, I don't have an answer to your question yeah. um, I, I know people want that Friday um, they do so do you want kids in just for the one day on Thursday because that's well, the reason I did not right. put that option forward. well this is this is where I, 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 I went yeah. through the same logic this afternoon and then I started thinking can we play with PD anywhere somehow that it's, I don't think the PD is the problem well so I think it's the Thursday September 1st is the problem. There's a half day on Friday. You, you know, give it some thought. I, I, I do, personally, I do appreciate that instruction earlier in the year is more effective than instruction in June. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll, I'll go out on a limb if I had to vote right now. And I, I know I said last meeting that I would prefer the later start, but you know, 
-hmm. I do worry about the effectiveness of those late days in June. Correct. So I really think it's our responsibility as a board to be as instructionally focused as we can. I, I don't know. So I, I don't know if there's an answer, and I don't know if anyone the committee has any feet, any thoughts or reactions. But my only thought was, can we go back one more time creatively and see if there's any alternative, knowing that September 1st on Thursday is part of the problem? I can create any option you're interested in. I just want to know what the parameters are. I know um, when I was going back through mm -hmm. my stuff from last year, last year Janet created this lovely list right. of historical um, data mm -hmm. on previous starts, and maybe that would be helpful in <laughs> framing our decision if we, it was included in our packet. My for plan next was to time. put that in the next so. packet. Okay, that's all. I just wanted to share that I'm still trying to figure this out. So we started in August. Just no, we had yeah, never. I mean, but it's still the week. I mean, I don't, I don't look at what day it is because it's still the week, the week before Labor Day, the week. You know, I think, I think the feel of it saying it's August 31st versus September 1st is a psychological it is, one. It is. If, if you're going to have to have your kids it's back August in school 30th. before Labor Day. Oh, it's, it's August 30th. But so let's say days, it were the Wednesday, the 31st. I don't think there's a measurable difference in having your child back in school on the 31st and the 1st as it is the 30, 30, because you still have to block that week off. Right. I think it is a psychological thing, but I don't, I don't know that I'm that interested in a calendar that feels good psychologically because none of them do. <laughs> so I, th I think it has to be something, a practical option that's substantially different that offers people something needy to talk about. So if we were to say we don't like the sound of going back in August, which is what I'm hearing you say, then we'll go Thursday the 1st, but then I'm asking, do, I, do you want me to include <coughs> Friday the 2nd as the second day of school that week or not. Because otherwise you're leaving the standalone September 1st, Thursday, where kids want to be there for the first day of school, but if families have plans, then they're gonna miss the first day of school. I, so is I that- I just wonder if we're talking about a, a whole shift. I mean, if, if instruction is always going to be better the beginning of the year, than the end of the year, right. then are we, I know when we discussed this last year, it was because Labor Day was extra late, and now it's just kind of late, or a little bit later. But I mean, really, right. if we're talking about this, aren't we, isn't it always going to be better to start the week before Labor Day? Not if Labor Day is the second. I mean, when the, when the calendar goes to say Tuesday, or you know, is the second or the third, it won't feel the same as it does last year and this year. These so are not few. Either way, you're talking a couple days. We have started very late. I remember yes. that. Yes. And, and once or twice historically, we've started before Labor Day. It's just not <coughs> tradition, right, right. I'd say, is a good word here. Mr. Chair. Please. Um, this is a procedural question. We have to vote on this, or we're scheduled to vote on whatever date in the universe we come up with. <laughs> when? At the next school committee meeting, three weeks from tonight. So, if we're if if we're introducing a possible third option, mm -hmm. and here we are, all very invested in doing this right, mm -hmm. as best as we can, should we push the vote out to consider it? Because we're going to have a third option that we don't even know what the heck it is. No, I, mean. I, I don't think we have to, Steve, and I'll tell you why. I, I, I think that's why I was bring, bringing it up tonight to give us and give Debbie some time to see us or even a third option that we could consider that night. Mm -hmm. But I think that night we'll know how people feel. I think we know already how people feel. I, know, I think it's a divided issue. Absolutely. So I think, I think that night, I don't know that we would need to give it any more time. I think it'll just be what are we most comfortable with as a board. I don't think the, ch the feelings will change with a third option mm -hmm. yeah in, in so, so procedurally I think we'd yeah. still be fine to vote that, that's fine I just wanted to throw that out there in yeah. case it turns into a long conversation so if okay. if it's helpful I mean one of the reasons I put it out extra early this year because it, it is so difficult mm -hmm. I, I know it doesn't sound like it should be but it truly is a very difficult People decision and I put it out in December so that it would be five weeks before the vote mm -hmm. instead of just a couple mm -hmm. and so in other years, it's just been a single night because oh. we're not going back till afternoon. We recommend let's not go back till Tuesday the 3rd or whatever it is, and everybody mm -hmm. feels good about it. It's a fairly easy vote many years. So I put it out five weeks before you have to vote, three weeks from tonight, which gives you more time to get feedback. But we do need a vote that night for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the, the we can't roll the power school, the, the semesters forward, which mm -hmm. has to happen before kids do their course selection in February. Mm -hmm. We need to have those yeah. dates in our system so that the dates are created and that they roll forward 
correctly with the end of the terms and all that stuff. Um, the second reason is that we want to give families enough time to plan if there's going to be a change that they have True. vacation. So I think, you know, six to seven months in advance mm -hmm. is, I wouldn't want to do it any sooner than that. So um, I'm not looking for us to solution it tonight. I just wanted to ask, is there a third option? One idea was to go back on the first. We've discussed why that's challenging. The only other idea I'll throw out there, again, thinking back through the feedback I read about today, um, on social media was is there a way to be creative that we could live with sometime later on in the year and I think I know the short answer to that I'm, I'm not sure I understand it well as, as an example people you know people asked a fair question you know which which I can understand you know do we need a February vacation and an April vacation oh. I, I'm not, That's I'm been not thrown out there a lot I'm not proposing that we do anything real radical um, necessarily but this is the sentiment, you know. So, so again, I'm just asking the question for you guys to spend a little time on between now and is, is, sure. is there a third option that gets creative that in this case starts after Labor Day okay. but helps us avoid getting into late June? And if right. the answer is no at the next meeting, that you spent some time and there's really no feasible way, then I think that's, we've done our due okay. diligence. But that, I, I would just ask you to take a look at one more time you know, there are questions about long weekends, PD yeah, day, you know. Um, so, so a couple of thoughts. Um, I personally, um, I will if you want me to, but I personally wouldn't publicly put out a, a discussion about taking two winter vacations, the, the spring and winter, and putting into one week for this reason. Many years ago, about 10 years ago, some school districts did that. Mm -hmm. And unless an entire region does it, say in another state, it, it tends not to work because people live in one town, so now you've got your kids in school when you're working, and it, it just, it's a, it's a very strange thing, but the districts that did do it, for the most part, have reverted back to the traditional New England um, vacations because it, it truly didn't work for them logistically. So given that I know that, mm -hmm. um, that I, I personally wouldn't be in favor of supporting a calendar option, because if you think starting a few days before Labor Day versus the Tuesday after Labor Day is a hard discussion, that one would really blow up for some some type of discussion does people have a lot of traditions around the winter breaks as well our sports things are, are built around that I agree. I remember so this that discussion that's a year. lot that's it that'll be a whole that's a couple meetings worth of a discussion yep. but if you want me to i could create that but i'm personally not in favor no. of appearing publicly or through the media to be promoting that because that would be very difficult um so I, I was using that as an example, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of I, the PD I be days, in favor of that either. you know, we have um, f uh, the teachers have a 585-day calendar, five days beyond the students, which we think are very important. Um, we front load three of them before the students come, partly because we believe that has a lot of power, and partly because then the during the year PD days impact families less. So of our five PD days, we do three before the kids come where families aren't impacted at all, and only two during the year, which is very reasonable and probably less than typical of interruption of the school year. So we're the only ones we know that front load three PD days. So I think the impact of the two PD days, one of which is going to have to be in the election day, which we discussed last time that, that Joe pointed out. So when you see the next iteration of all of these, you're going to see the October PD day move to the election day mm -hmm. because that is uh, logistically very difficult to have school in session with that many people going for it. So every four years when there's a presidential election, we move our PD day. So I, unless you're telling me differently tonight, I'm going to move the PD day in October to that November date um, because it is the wisest thing to do and you, safest. it's the safest, safest thing to do. So that only leaves us one at the end of January to play with. So That's the only alternative for that would be to put that PD day on the day after the kids get out in June, which logistically is difficult, never mind that it has no value to teachers. Right. But um, we sometimes get speakers or people to come in, and with the moving of the end of the year with snow days, yeah. you don't really know what day you're contracting with or what day courses are starting and all of that. So we're really only talking about the potential to use one PD day that interrupts the student's school day. Just putting that out there. So mm -hmm. if you want uh, us to think about moving the January day, the only possibility for us is to put it then. I will ask you the one question I have wondered about. 
which if you wouldn't mind, you don't have to weigh in tonight, but if you want to let me know before I create the next packet. Uh, coming back on Monday the 2nd, the day after New Year's Day, we have to check what our contracts say, because our, our uh, union contracts will say, not for teachers, well, for other, for full year employees. Like, if, if yeah, the Monday holiday falls on this, there. then you have that off. Okay. So I do want to check that, because that just occurred to me. Yeah. But do you, w we have the 2nd off, because we typically have the day after New Year's off. But if we'd have to check what our union contracts say, but there's a possibility of one day right there. But I don't know if one day, we, whether it's that Monday or whether it's the PD day we have to play with, whether one day could make that much of a difference in the calendar, I'm not sure. Okay. Joe. I have a suggestion. If Christmas Eve falls on a, a weekday, it should be a half day because that's what they used to do. Christ that's Christmas covered day. in the contracts, actually. Like Christmas, like students for a half day, like the day before Thanksgiving? No, just like they do for the day before Thanksgiving. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because yeah, okay. that's what they used to do in Attleboro, somewhat, one of the ed assistants told me. Right, but this coming year, Joe, um, Christmas Eve is on a Saturday, so it doesn't help us. Okay, then the other thing I wanted to bring up about a good calendar scenario, it, role play, is that. One year, when I went to the Callahan Elementary School in Norwood, uh -huh. they started, because this is like the same calendar year, like 11 years ago. I was, in 2011, I was going to think about if it was going to suggest, because one of the earliest suggestions from when we did a survey of all the parents mm -hmm. was August 31st. So after a bad 2005 winter, mm -hmm. the, the town of Norwood decided to do, go back to school for two days, August 31st and September 1st, then have a four-day weekend, right? and then get out on June 16, 2006. That's so early. so that could be option three, is to come back August 31st and September 1st, but then you're only gaining, the uh, as opposed to um, the yellow draft you see here, draft two, where we have the kids coming back on the Tuesday. It only buys you that one day, and I think if you're already a family that Make can't go on vacation that week, the one day probably isn't going to matter and might help to go. So okay. I just need, wh so what would be the parameters of option three that you'd like us to create? And we can send that out to you ASAP. I don't think there are any parameters that I had in mind as the one who brought this up. I, I just think, you know, was there a third option that could exist? And I think you've so far help me <laughs> be convinced no. that they're probably you know that the so i think i think the analysis you're going through is all it's we can ask for you know well, um, we know the more minds that are put to it though so last year i gave you three options this year i couldn't come up with a third that made any sense to entertain the notion of so i didn't but maybe somebody else could that's why i'm asking because i couldn't personally come up with anything else yeah. what's the that last day of june this year for next year so far yeah if for for the calendar you're talking about, the calendar year you're talking about, um, so 2017. Oh, okay. What's the last day? All right, day? so if we bring students back, option one, after Labor Day, yep. the last day of June is June 19th, with the five snow days could be the 26th. Which was Because we have year. to talk. With the students coming back before Labor Day, it would be June 14th, and with the five snow days, it would be at the outset, June 21. Okay. So that's the difference. Can you think of any other time to put the PD day? But I don't. I don't know that that will buy I us a lot. I don't think that impact anything. Not really. So I. I can't personally. Okay. Well, I couldn't come up with anything, but somebody else probably can. Just uh, because I couldn't. <laughs> no, I think it's somewhat limited, which is part of the challenge. Joe could. Joe. Yeah, I'll ask <laughs> Joe. To, actually, we can't do it. We can't do it. Let me ask <laughs> Joe to come up with it. <laughs> I will call it to option one three, one Joe, right. Joe G special. <laughs> because, you know, that would be probably our best bet at this point if we wanted something else. What I would offer is if you can't come up with a third option, it's okay. <laughs> okay. If, no you, if you guys, if, you, don't have to, you don't have to create something just because I brought this up tonight. All right. You know, you've, you've, you've given a pretty good. Okay. But, if, you know, if anything makes sense to you, then bring it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll vote on what we have. Okay. Okay. If anyone thinks of anything, let me know because if I could, you know, like I was hoping he'll, like, oh, I, I didn't think of that, and then I could create it. So are you interested in the September 1st one day coming back? I think we either come back on the 30th or we come back after right. I, I like door I'm one sorry, Bruce, door two. But yeah. I, I, okay. I think it's just like going to be one or the other. I just want to make sure that we've entertained 
all notions that are educationally fairly sound and that offer us a good choice. You definitely yeah. lose the kids in June. I mean, that's that's a fact of life. You totally. totally. I mean, the only other time in professional development that we've talked about that's educationally sound is a March date versus a January date, and that doesn't help the cost. No, it doesn't help the cost. No. Okay. Motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. Anyone want a second? I would like to second that motion. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Happy New Year and Happy good night. Year. Thank you.